kind of go right into your story. Um, yeah. And, and so actually I'm just going to sit back and let you drive because I already want to ask so many questions about um, concussions and uh, traumatic brain injury, but you drive, tell us your story, Molly. Yeah. So I am a physical therapist and I had been working in a small orthopedic clinic right out of school and had my dream job working with um, orthopedic patients, which is, you know, knee pain and back pain. Okay. But we also got kind of the tougher folks in town. They had odd cases or they had sensitive nervous systems or they didn't quite fit into a box. So that was kind of my background out of school was learning how to treat people that had multiple systems involved and how can we address function to get these people back to their meaningful activities. Well, and can I, so, okay, now I'm guilty of, uh, I do want to ask, did, were you always, did you always know you wanted to be a physical therapist or what kind of led you down that path? I, growing up, I wanted to be a marine biologist. I loved the ocean. I loved sharks in particular. And then come high school time, I started to get a little bit more into, I'd always played soccer and I'd always been an athlete, but I started to get more interested in the body and doing some yoga and Pilates. And then I had a soccer injury, which was my first introduction into physical therapy Mm -hmm. and liked it, but really kind of put it on the shelf. And I went to college thinking I was going to be a psychologist actually. Ah, nice. Okay. And then my sophomore year, my uh, editor said, you know, you're taking all your elective courses are within kinesiology. And I didn't even know what it was. And so um, come to learn, it's, you know, usually the major for folks that are pre-med or pre-chiropractic or pre-physical therapy. So I ended up doing an internship with a physical therapist and he was so passionate about about what he did and he was so excited and his patients loved him so much and he made such meaningful change in their lives that I thought this is what I wanted to do and then okay from there I and so for those who don't know that because I didn't know for a while kinesiology is what the study of movement is that right Mm -hmm. the study of movement in the human body yeah okay okay perfect okay so then that uh, that sets the stage you got your dream job orthopedic clinic all right yeah, so I just finished my doctorate not too long before that, and I was out with a group of girlfriends celebrating. Um, one of them had passed her boards and gotten into the residency program, and we all went out to celebrate. And we were leaving dinner and dancing, and a cab driver fell asleep at the wheel and went into a crowded sidewalk where we all were. So he ended up hitting myself and about 15 other people. Wow. Um, I initially impacted on the bumper and then my head just kind of clotheslined me. So my head hit the windshield and then someone landed on top of me. So it was kind of like a double impact and then getting off the hood of the car, you know, instant pain, instant bump, but really thinking I was very lucky. Um, There was a woman who pinned between the building and the car who had some serious um, injuries. And so I'd stopped and helped her And I just remember thinking I'd gotten away, you know, not scot-free, but that I'd really escaped what could have been something potentially much more serious. And at that point, I, I forgot what happened. So I forgot where we were. I forgot why we were there. I looked at my friend and asked her if something bad had happened. Um, So they took me to the emergency room uh, in an ambulance. And it was just, you know, ambulances coming in and out, bringing batches of people and they discharged me the next day. You know, my legs were x-rayed and they were fine. Um, I had a CT scan. I had no bleeds. Everything was okay. And I felt l- very lucky. Um, shortly after, of course, I went into what we would consider the post-concussive sequelae, which is where you're becoming symptomatic and those symptoms are getting a little bit worse. So I started with severe headaches, um, dizziness, nausea, fatigue, feeling generally disoriented, just kind of out of it. Um, how long, how long does it, are we talking like within the first week or can this be weeks after or months after or? Uh, usually people will feel symptomatic with concussions fairly immediately within 24 to 48 hours, if not immediately. Um, and then the typical progression for most folks is that those symptoms will begin to subside and be gone at about 10 to 14 days. Oh, okay. And so at about 10 to 14 days, I was feeling significant worse. So I was starting to get um, very, very severe headaches, um, very just out of it where I wasn't quite cognitively there. I didn't have that flexibility anymore. But at this time, this was eight years ago. So nobody knew what it was. Nobody had really heard of post-concussion syndrome. Most people didn't attribute it to the concussion at all. Um, So what, so it started what was eventually a a two-year process of getting 
so severe that the left side of my body began to atrophy. Wow. Um, I was in horrible pain all day, every day, severe headaches. I rarely slept because I was in so much pain. Um, severe dizziness, severe fatigue. I had nausea, like mouth-watering nausea all the time. Um, and it was working memory issues. So I would be you know, with a patient and I would hold, you know, one plus one in my head long enough to add three to it. Um, and so I began to see doctors. No one really knew what to do with me. It was a lot. It'll just go away or it's psychological. Oh. And it progressed to the point where I stopped being able to feed and dress myself. I stopped for, like remembering how to put on my shoes. Wow. Um, I would have to really take myself through those processes and people saying you're fine because I looked so normal. Um, starting to have a hard time with speech, a hard time in crowds. I really shouldn't have been driving. I couldn't do computer work. And so I was two years out of school with these massive student loans, this job that I, you know, would have bent over backwards to keep. Um, and ultimately I just couldn't keep going. So I ended up taking a month off, went home, slept for about 16 hours a day, wow. um, started to feel a little bit better felt very crushed financially. So went back to work too soon, everything back again. And then about three years, it just went from bad to worse where it was like all my compensations that had been keeping me just barely head above water. Just, I mean, it was like Jenga, just kaput. Yeah. Um, what were people well, doing? I mean, the, the doctor, well, the doctors you would see throughout that, I mean, are they trying different medications? Are you trying mindfulness? Are you trying, I mean, are you trying all kinds of things? Oh, I'm trying everything under the sun. So I'm a, you know, as physical therapy, we're big believers and we retrain function um, so that these, you know, these are active worries and that you're doing what you can. So I had changed my diet. I'd been to probably 20 healthcare providers up till then wow. and really no one knew what to do with me. People suggested MS. They tried a lot of different medications, none of which worked. Um, I tried physical therapy, but the physical therapist at the time did their absolute best and trial me, but just didn't have the knowledge base to be equipped to handle a case like mine. I would Google, you know, post concussion syndrome and say, well, it's probably psychological. You know, it was before this big switch happened. And so it was really frustrating because I watched my life crumble and I'm motivated and, you know, educated in the healthcare system and I'm just falling through the cracks and it's so easy. Um, and it was really just this, very, very frustrating experience. And then the more frustrated you became, the more people said, well, maybe it's emotional. <laughs> oh. it's just, it was just like, you felt like you were going nuts. So about three and a half years in, my visual system didn't work at all. My eyes didn't work together. I couldn't track. I could do smooth pursuits. I couldn't read, write, drive. I could barely dress myself. Um, I had started to shake from head to toe. Um, my memory was terrible. My speech was so bad that I had a hard time following conversations and finding my words. Um, I had personality changes where I would just burst into tears for no particular reason. Um, it was really everything under the sun kind of that could go wrong did go wrong. Mm -hmm. So I ended up um, bed bound at about three and a half years moving back to Spokane with my mom making all my meals and the hardest part of mine was bathing. You know, I couldn't wow. shampoo or like shave my legs in the same day because I didn't have the stamina. Wow. Um, we later realized that I had severe autonomic dysfunction. So every time I stood up, I wasn't getting blood flow in my brain. So I felt like I was passing out. It was just, um, you know, it was just a mess. And so about the four year point, we finally started to meet people who knew what they were doing. We finally started to meet people who understood concussions. We finally started to meet people who could do diagnostic testing that was actually going to pull out some of the things that was wrong. So um, you'd like, you'd like the, was it, was it the, the science had to catch up? I mean, were you feel like you were right on that bleeding edge? I was right on that cusp of yeah. that big boom yeah. of awareness. Okay. Um, and so I eventually, and then it was partly me too, getting better at figuring out who kind of knew what, um, okay. and it was finding people you know, at that, I think overall now I've seen 80 healthcare providers. So it oh, was wow. really trying and what I could think of. And then it became very clear who got it and who did it. And those people were the ones that led me to other people. So, you know, I had severe visual issues, severe speech issues, vestibular problems. And we started to kind of dig out of all those things. About five years in, I ended up in a clinic in Utah 
where I had a functional MRI and my brain was functioning so poorly. And a functional MRI is where you lay in a standard MRI, what looks like a standard MRI, and you're doing cognitive tasks. So they might ask you to um, show you a picture and you would name the animal in your head or, you know, something like that. And what it's doing is it's looking at where the blood flow is in your brain. So what areas are functioning a little too much and which ones aren't functioning quite enough. Kind of like when you do an activity, the blood flow goes to the muscles that you're using. Mm. Like if you were running, it's a yes. similar concept. Um, so I had great success there. Pretty much fixed the speech problems and the personality problems. My IQ had dropped. That came back. And so that let me kind of guide my care a little bit better. What, how, did, um, how did that? So you have the functional brain scan or the, the yeah, so you can see the, um, you can see the area of the brain and how that's working, but how did you, how did you regain those skills? So there is a little bit in the concussion world of calling weeks. So it's folks playing with the idea that maybe rehab doesn't have to be quite as long as we think it does. Maybe it doesn't have to be this long drawn out process. Can we, really target the areas that aren't working well and then intensively focus in on them throughout the, through a short period of time and make significant mm. changes. Finding a lot of cases, yeah, we can. So this particular program focused on that, those specific blood flow areas in the brain. Um, it's what we call neurovascular uncoupling so that you're not getting um, the blood flow quite like you should. And it's through a series of like a multidisciplinary team exercises. So I would see a speech therapist and we would go over things like um, remembering numbers, remembering them forward and backwards, um, reading a story and do a what can I recall, um, those type of things. I would see an occupational therapist who did a lot of visual tracking, um, visual searching exercises, teaching me coping skills, go over sleep sleep is really important. Um, we did various machines where we would work on things like um, reaction time, tracking, um, getting physical activity back, so getting blood flow to the brain and then really working that particular area. Um, and it's an intensive like 8 to 4.30 a day wow. of rehab, um, which is really brutal. I was <laughs> saying, I, was, I, didn't like, I, was, I feel like I saw school again, right? Yeah. Yeah. And so for me, I was like, I will... I'd rather be in a place where people know their stuff and putting in eight hours of rehab than at home struggling. So got a good improvement from that, but then realized that the shaking I developed and the weakness I developed had responded almost a little adversely. And so then it was again, realizing on my own, I had a sensory motor issue, which is where um, the sensory information you're taking in and the motor output you're giving out aren't quite right. So mm -hmm your brain's image of where your body is and your physical body aren't. Being. And so you end up with feeling disembodied, um, not being able to strengthen. People will end up either where they'll be, they'll shake or when they move, they'll have kind of what we call dyskinetic motions. Okay. So then I was like, great. great. So now I figured out the concussion, finally get it treated. And now of course I have this oddball thing that most people don't have. And I'm back to square one of trying to find people who can't tr who treat something that's odd to treat. So it took me about a year, <clears throat> but I ended up at a conference with the gal who makes a lot of the sensory motor protocols. And we were just going to add. And she said, you know, at the conference finished early, why don't you come and share your story with everyone? And we'll see if someone in the audience, you know, knows how to help you. Mm -hmm. And so I did. And I stood up there at the time I had my um, arm would curl up and in and my head was shaking and wow. told my story and there was a gal in the audience from UCLA who came up to me afterwards and said you work with the LA movement disorder team and I've seen people like you and I think you know we could help mm -hmm. and that was the first person who's told me I've seen someone like you because okay. um, I'd been a neurologist and physiatrist and no one knew what to do with me so I ended up going there I made a tremendous amount of progress um, I the video, I have a video, I think, on my Instagram page where um, it almost looked like I had a stroke or cerebral palsy back to moving fairly normally. Um, within about a year, we intended to finish up my eyes and my jaw. For whatever reason, that wasn't quite responding. So this, I'm just a long, long story. So I ended up with a functional neurologist who's usually a chiropractor who finishes chiropractor school, and then they do a three-year postdoc specifically on the neuroscience of the brain and the pathway. Wow how we retrain them. So I ended up with that gentleman, made some more progress, but wasn't quite there. So I ended up doing one more intensive week about a month ago. 
Hospital um, with a functional neurologist who specialized post concussion with a movement disorder component. Um, it was extremely successful. We kind of have it narrowed down to one last area of the brain that we're working on. Um, assuming that stabilizes the way we expect it to, um, they expect me to still be within the realm of making a full recovery sometime this year. Wow. So that is eight years with a brain injury that is thought to be untreatable. All my progress being after four years, where we tell most people, you know, after two years, just learn to live with it. Um, so it's really helping people to understand that these injuries are essentially software problems. They're okay. not hardware problems. So if, if we can give people the right input and train the areas of the brain that aren't working in the proper way, we can really see substantial improvements um, and in a time frame that most people think of as, you know, too fast or that's not possible. So like so the, I, yeah. The, when, you, when you were tracking or taking care of then the, the movement, um, was it similar to the, the treatment in Utah where is it just, it, is, it, is it repetitive um, exercises or things done that target a certain part of the brain? Is that what you're doing? Yeah. So for their approaches were a little different. Utah is looking at, you know, blood flow. And then this particular clinic looks at the neuroscience of, so like what specific pathways aren't functioning in the brain quite like they ought to. And then they target that with exercise. So that yeah. looked um, more like it was still an eight to four type of a thing. But so for me, for example, my left inner ear, the, little canals that tell us where we are in space when we move our head, my brain wasn't red brain at all. So it was doing positioning techniques where it would let the shaking in my body go in such a way that the inner ear could then communicate with the brain again and they could start to recalibrate, so to speak. Wow. Um, we would do exercises, for example, where I was tracking with my eyes or I would putting on a screen and they're meant to either upregulate or downregulate certain parts of your brain. So we're targeting exercises that force a certain part to work in such a way that kind of resets, so to speak. Um, so yeah, it was a really, I've learned a lot. It was a very interesting experience. Also, and, and boy, you, you sum up this, uh, like say eight year period and, and it was yeah. successful. Were there periods throughout that, even after the four year mark where you're starting to get some um, movement back or the, the, your IQ or speech. Um, did you feel at times like I, I've capped it? I mean, I've done as much as I can. Were there times where you thought you had plateaued? I, it's a lot of forward and back. It's a big fat okay. roller coaster. You, know those, you see those things that, you know, recovery isn't linear and uh -huh. boy, is that especially for logical injuries. Um, it is a lot of patience. It is a lot of learning to let go of how things are supposed to be. It's a lot of learning how to take care of yourself. Um, and then it's just a lot of perseverance because it's very frustrating when you have multiple areas of the brain that require multiple different professions and they all need to have this specific understanding and understand what the other ones do. And putting that together in a community where this is still new is just hard. Um, so it was a very forward and back frustrating experience. And ultimately I told myself, as long as I'm improving, I'm going to keep trying. Um, okay. So I didn't have any long, long, long periods of plateau where I thought this was it. Um, but it was a lot of forward and back. What was the, what was that? I mean, the first four years though, in, you know, like you say, you it, previously, after a couple of years, people are been, are told, Hey, this is how you are. I mean, were you, and it did sound like you were told, Hey, nothing's wrong. Right. So how did you keep going there? Yeah, it was so frustrating because it's like, you know, normally for those kind of injuries, if someone says to you, you know, this is it, learn to live with them, you can kind of do that and we'll all show you type of thing. Yeah. Where this case, it was like, there's not a problem at all. You're fine. Just wow. go back to doing the stuff, you know, and it was so frustrating because I'd been you know, working since I was 12, I've been physically active for as long as I can remember. I just finished my doctorate. I was working two jobs. And then all of a sudden it was, I would have thought someone would have thought it was so out of character for me not to be able to barely function. And instead it was a lot of character insinuations, which I think is unfortunately the case for a lot of these people. Yeah. Um, which just adds, then you're having to defend the recovery rather than put right. that energy healing. And it's just, it's really frustrating. I can't imagine as a therapist, I mean, um, even that where you're trying to, you know, I don't know if there were people that were just saying, you know, don't fight it. You need to accept this. And then that's when you can heal or grow or, and I mean, and, 
and yeah, you're wanting to say no. And, and they're even looking at that as like, man, you're fused to this, I still can get better story. And it, I mean, that's, that had to have been kind of crazy. It, I was thinking in my head there when you uh, talked about seeing 80 different professionals and you got to learn quickly of how they operate. Um, man, there's a book project, right? I mean, you could teach uh, classes on bedside manner. Yeah. And, I mean, would you get it to the point where you knew within a few minutes that, oh man, this is, you know, this person, okay. Yeah, you, ever, you can tell. Did, did you ever walk out? Did you ever just walk out? I never walked out. And a lot of it, part of my journey was um, learning how to set my boundaries and how to not people please. Okay. Um, Pete good. a while. So there was times in the beginning where I would stay with people and I knew we didn't quite have it and I knew they didn't really get it, but I felt either obligated or I didn't want them to feel bad that yeah. I didn't come back, which is just me. Um, or I didn't know what else to do. And so I would just, you know, keep coming. Whereas as I progressed, it got to the point where, you know, we're all doing the best we can. They're doing the best they can with what they know. And if they don't have the knowledge base to help me, that's okay. They might be great for another set of patients, but not for me. And to be able to move on um, and then to be able to move on particularly from the dismissive ones um, yeah. and how to put that in perspective and find empathy and then not let it negatively affect your recovery was all just a big big learning curve yeah so all right and now are you heading in the direction of it I mean is this going to be your work now because of the your experience oh. Yeah. Yeah. Well, if we would have asked me that two years ago, I would have said absolutely no because I was so worn down with trying to explain something to people that they weren't just really ready to hear. Um, and then the last couple of years, it shifted for me. And a year ago, I started to feel really strong urgency um, that people needed to know that they needed to have the basic information that took me years to learn. Um, yeah. I'd done a little bit of teaching at the course at the physical therapy program that I'd gone through um, and felt like I wasn't well enough to do things in the capacity that I really wanted to. So I turned to social media, which was, um, I was not a big social media person pre accident. I hadn't been on either for quite some time actually. Um, but started to decide that I want people to have this information, have the skill set, and have the tools so that they're not laying on their couch for three years being told us when that's not, we know that's not going to help. Um, understanding that there's different types of concussions and how to match their symptoms to the right people so they're not running all over town. Um, started that about nine months ago, um, and it's been very successful. And then with the hopes that as I begin to recover, that I could then um, start a career with creating you know, courses for healthcare providers, materials for patients that I wish I would have had um, teaching and speaking and that sort of thing. And so it was a way that I could help others while being mindful that my life might look differently with the limitations that I may or may not have. Moving okay. Forward, so. so do you feel like, um, I mean, concussions are, and I work with a fair amount of athletes, so I do get the football players primarily. I've had a couple of you know, rugby people that, uh, that have had concussions. I mean, do you feel like a lot of people, mm -hmm. if, they, if it hasn't happened because of a sport, that it must not be a concussion? Do you feel, is there still like a knowledge that needs to be around concussions in general? Yeah, I think there's pretty uh, still a big knowledge gap on a lot of things. And that's one common myth is that, you know, that it's a sports and, and it's, it's actually sports, I think is the eighth leading cause. It's actually mm -hmm. car accidents. Mm -hmm. okay. Or not, excuse me, not car accidents. It's falls is the number one cause falls? of concussions. Falls. falls, yeah. So just slipping in your bathtub, slipping on some ice um, is where we actually see the most. Wow. So, do, and so do you feel like most people just think it is, it's a headache. It'll, it'll go away. I mean, do, is that the biggest myth, I guess, or do people not get it treated for a long time? I think people usually think it'll go away. I think people are unaware of what they are in general and their healthcare providers may or may not be current. Um, mm -hmm. the other challenge is that now that we finally realize that, this is a brain injury and that it needs to be properly managed or people can have these long-term consequences like I did. Yeah. Um, now we have this massive influx of information and research and it is so challenging to keep current. Um, it really is. I mean, it's almost a full-time job. You almost have to exclusively focus on concussion or find some sort of resource that's condensing that down for you um, because it's moving so quickly. So it's really one where you need someone who is very current, like continuing in within a year, 
two years tops. Otherwise, they're outdated. And it's right, because it's moving so quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, I, on your website, you have a, uh, it's prime your brain for neuroplasticity. Um, you've got an ebook. Yeah. So, I mean, what, what does that consist of? What, what, what do you, you know, what do you kind of bring awareness to? Yeah. So neuroplasticity is basically this idea that we're not hardwired, we're softwired. So we can change our brain in both structure and function through our environment and our thoughts and our activity and what we're, you know, the information we're taking in, whether you can be from the news or what kind of media we're consuming, um, that we're, we're these plastic beings. And so with that understanding and applying it specifically to brain injury rehab, um, how do we make it so that the brain is in the best state so it can learn and it can heal? And that's what the ebook is. And particularly for the folks that, don't have access to a lot of stuff in town or they have a very limited amount of money that they can put towards treatment or they're going to these intensive weeks which are kind of expensive how do they maximize link potential and feel more empowered that they have some say so in how their body changes and heals yes. and in the ebook we break it down into three of the basic things and so the first one is when we have an injury we tend to be in that fight or flight state. Um, people with pulse concussive tend to, they can't process the world around them as quickly as it's coming. So they tend to feel that fight or flight overdrive all the time. Mm -hmm. um, and what we know about, you know, it's fight or flight or it's rest and digest. And we want to be in fight and flight when we're in danger. That keeps us safe. That's kind of one of our most viable sort of tools. But when that danger's passed, we want the nervous system to have the flexibility then to go into the parasympathetic parasympathetic state and that state is really where you can learn where you can heal where you can feel connected to others and to yourself so people that feel disembodied or just like that disconnection that's one of the first places we go and it's really simple breathing techniques um so it's teaching them you know some they can do and they're maybe if they're having anxiety but i teach one in particular that i want them to do before every single rehab session they do simply because it shifts their nervous system into the state where it can learn and heal, um, which is going to maximize their rehab session. And it's, it's easy. It's free. They can do it anywhere. You can do it in any country. It's, you know, it's a really nice tool. I say, are you okay with that? Can you share the, the secret sauce here? I mean, is this uh, what, what's the, yeah, so it's, um, it's based on the heart math Institute and the heart math Institute takes a look at how the brain and how the heart connects and how we can use our breathing to change how one or the other is doing so we can change our heart rate we can change the way our nervous system is functioning we can shift it into the state we want and we can really it's a really powerful tool for virtually anything and for any people who even aren't you know in recovery you can use it just in your day-to-day -day. so it is i call it the peter pan breathing technique because nice. you can have these thoughts so, so the idea is you're slowing the breathing down so that you're accessing the parasympathetic state and then you're adding what we call heart rate coherence where when we're in a calm and happy state you'll see the heart waves kind of go nice and smooth versus when we're like frustrated or agitated they go kind of funky so it's combining those those two things to get your nervous system in the ideal state and it's pretty simple so it's sitting straight up Okay. Eyes open because you want to take in the world around you and feel safe. And it's breathing in through your nose for a count of five and then out through your mouth for a count of five. As you're doing that, take into account where your breath is coming from. So if you feel like you can put a hand on your chest and a hand on your, that lower rib cage and belly, if you feel as you're taking that deep breath in through your nose that your chest is rising, Practice shifting that breath down into the lower belly. We want to try to get the diaphragm and the lower part of the lungs where we get a lot of that good juicy oxygen working. Um, the second reason for that is when you're breathing through your chest, it strains the neck muscles and it can add to headaches and things like that. So once people get that in through the nose, the out through the mouth, it's coming from, you know, their lower rib cage, we're getting the nice expansion, then you add in a happy thought. And it should be a time where you felt safe, where you felt calm, where you felt joyful. Um, and you're just breathing, thinking that thought for about two to five minutes. 
So in the beginning, folks will need about five minutes to get their nervous system to shift. Once they're well practiced, it'll take a couple minutes and they'll be in that state for several hours. So it's a really nice pre, any time you want to learn or if you're in school or if you want, you know, you're going to see family and you really want to feel that connection time with them um, in rehab of any kind, doing that right before is thing that can really on your nervous system. And I'll, I mean, I'll do it in like a waiting room. You can do it in your car. You can do it everywhere. You're anywhere and everywhere and not, you know, no one really knows you do. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> I say, I, I love, so I've been a mindfulness guy. I've done podcasts on mindfulness. I've had guests talk about mindfulness. I, I love the in through the nose, out through the mouth breathing. But as you were just talking that through, I've actually never done it where I'm um, going through my belly. And that was a, that was a whole different yeah. experience. That was kind of nice. Yeah. You know, like when you're getting the chest, particularly for people that have headaches, it, uses a lot of the accessory muscles in the front of our neck and that yeah. contribute to headache, to feeling shortness of breath, to feeling lightheaded, to feeling anxious. And, um, so it's shifting that down. And I picture some people end up pushing their belly out. So I tell them, picture your rib cage is expanding outwards and then coming back in. Oh, you just got me. I was sticking my belly out. Yeah. Right. Now I got the ribs going. That's better. Belly out. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> when you were saying nobody will even know, I thought, man, Molly, you should see my tummy right now. I mean, it's, you know, I'm, I'm <laughs> okay. That's good. I really, I really like that a lot. Um, yeah. All right. One of the things that I, I've even, I've done, I've done um, a podcast on sleep. I wish I have this, I wish I didn't have to sleep. I would love to be a vampire. I would have more time to get things done, but I know it's yeah. important. You mentioned it earlier and on your website, when you're talking about what you'll learn through your program restoring quality sleep. I kind of want to plug my ears because I don't want to hear that I need to sleep more, but talk about what sleep yeah. do for the brain. Sleep is very important. Um, so it's where we um, get rid of toxins that we accumulate throughout the day. It's where we store our short-term into long-term memory. Um, it's really, you know, the rest of the body has the lymphatic system where we can kind of flush out anything we don't want. The brain does that kind of its own version of a lymphatic flush while we sleep. So it's really critical, especially for the folks who are recovering from injury, that they get the proper amount. The frustration becomes when you really want to get that quality sleep and you're having a hard time falling asleep, you're having a hard time staying asleep, you're getting insomnia, you know, those kind of things. So we talk about what are some ways that you can restore that. <clears throat> so we go through sleep hygiene, which is, you know, step one, which we all know we may or may not implement as much Big one for concussion is screen time. So you're wanting to decrease that blue light at least an hour, ideally two or three before you go to bed so that your brain can then shift into that sleep state. Um, it's things like keeping the room cool. Um, I tell people, pretend like it's the 1990s. I don't want your cell phone in your room as your alarm clock. <laughs> it should be an actual alarm clock. Um, little switches like that can be really helpful. And that also helps people not wake up and check their phones in the middle of the night, which just makes it harder to sleep or wake up in the morning and spend an hour on like Instagram before they get their day going. Yeah. Um, so that they're, you know, starting that kind of reactive type of a day. So we're doing sleep hygiene. We teach a couple uh, relaxation techniques. So the first one is progressive muscle relaxation. So they've done their sleep hygiene. They've gotten in bed, you know, they go to bed and wake up at the same time every day. And then you, lay in bed and you're progressively starting from your feet, moving up to your head, contracting and relaxing each muscle. Mm -hmm. And then we say, take about 20 minutes. Within about 20 minutes, you're not asleep. Get out of bed, go to a quiet place in your house, you know, read a newspaper, listen to something, stay off screens, but do something kind of boring. Once you feel sleepy, get back into bed. Um, the idea is that we're training the body that the bed is a place that you sleep so that once you're in it, it's going to start to automatically kind of wind down. Um, that's really frustrating for people when they first start because they find mm -hmm. that they're getting out of bed a lot. Um, eventually it corrects. Um, the other things we'll look at like magnesium is one before bed. Um, particularly magnesium urinate is the one that's more bioavailable to the brain. Um, some folks like melatonin, some folks get a funky reaction to it. Um, and for most people, if they're doing those things and then they're getting the underlying cause of their headaches or whatever it is treated, that's pretty well. We'll have folks that have done everything and they're still really struggling. And in concussion recovery, we tend to look at hormones then okay. when we have people who just really aren't able to restore it. Um, 
where we'll see shifts in hormones after concussion, particularly with the pituitary gland, and that can help shift sleep like, dramatically. Hey, um, can I say, do you have, uh, are there, you talk about magnesium, you talk about um, melatonin, are there other, I don't know if you're a supplement person, I mean, do you, do you think there are things that are, because you, you see a bunch of things that talk about brain health, or do you have thoughts on that? I do. I, so I'll preface this by saying my background is not in nutrition. Mm -hmm. um, I, in physical therapy school, we get nutrition as it relates to our stroke patients or diabetic patients or gout. You know, we get that sort of nutrition. Uh, for concussions, you're going to have any number of supplements that are recommended. Yeah. We tend to have three that fit for most everyone. One being magnesium, the other one being fish oil, and then the third one being curcumin, which is a great anti-inflammatory um, and can also contribute to so things like changing your diet, adding in anti-inflammatory foods and supplements can also help with sleep. Okay. So those are the big three. And then past that, what I actually tell people is people are going to tell you a bajillion different things and they're going to contradict and you're going to end up with this medicine cabinet of supplements right. in your or cupboard or wherever you have them. So what I typically recommend doing is getting with someone who really understands post-concussion syndrome and wants to get to kind of the roots of the problem, who are able to take a look, do some blood work, and take a look at okay. what you might need a little bit more of, what you might need a little bit less of. That's usually covered by insurance, and then they can start to give you a regimen. We can go through your gut health, they can go through which supplements you need, and it's structured, and it's um, that I find is quite a bit easier for people than buying everything that they hear about is there a go-to uh i don't know exercises for the brain i mean or or is it just about getting blood flow or is it about just keeping your brain stimulated or any kind of thoughts around there um for our concussion folks there's different types of concussions mm. and when we see people that have persistent cases they tend to fall in one to six of or six to seven different trajectories, usually in a combination. Um, and then they tend to have five or six areas that aren't quite working right. And each of those will have their own unique exercises. So for example, someone with um, blood flow impairment, you might recognize that because they're intolerant to exercise. When they try to get their heart rate up, they get a bad headache. They feel like they're oh, wow. going to pass out. They feel like they're puke, you know, that sort of thing we do a guided gradual return to exercise. So what we'll do is we start with a walking test where we put them on a treadmill and we're monitoring their heart, we're monitoring their symptoms, and then we're slowly increasing the speed at which they're walking on the treadmill and the incline. Every minute we monitor their symptoms. Once we get to a heart rate where they've seen those symptoms spike, we start to exercise them at about 90% of that. Mm -hmm. um, so where they're doing about 20 to 30 minutes a day of exercise at that that specific target heart rate for their blood flow impairment. Um, and then we slowly increase it from there. That tends to work fairly well. We'll also get folks who will have atomic dysfunction. So their brain is not regulating their heart rate like it should. So those can be a little bit more tricky. Um, and depending on which type they have, take some different types of exercises. Um, but that's kind of that group. And then we'll have people that have, you know, they might have symptoms coming from their neck. So we'll do, you know, neck treatment. They might have symptoms coming from their eyes. So we retrain, can the eyes work together? Can, can they accommodate? Can they diverge? And we'll go through those types of things. Um, so it's really figuring out which specific area isn't working for you and then targeting it appropriately. Okay. Um, what I was hoping you would say is we only need two to four hours of sleep, um, that uh, dark chocolate is all you need for a supplement, and that uh, long-distance running will cure all. But I, did, I didn't hear The good news is dark chocolate's a good one. Okay. You right. can have I do, chocolate well, you want. Well, I do, okay, I, was, I do like that one where I will have pe people say that, yeah, dark chocolate's healthy, but then I don't think I should probably eat the whole, like, giant bar a day. That kind of I guess that's true. Moderation, huh? Fair enough. Um, mm -hmm. Molly, this was great. I, I am so grateful for, uh, I, I mean, I, you know, I tried to, this is, here's my truth, right? I love going to uh, like a movie and I don't know everything about it. I try not to read as much about it. I'd had somebody recommend that I, that I seek you out. I did a real quick, like, okay, she's got a, I want to hear the story. I'm fascinated by the brain. Um, I did not know like the, that journey that you've been on. It's, it's a miracle to kind of, and, and yeah. now I feel like, boy, you, you are, probably one of the only people who can speak to like the, I mean, the seven, eight year recovery and 80 physicians later and what works and does, I mean, it's just incredible. So uh, 
I don't know, I'm kind of looking forward to following your journey and uh, yeah. I, will be able to, I will be able to point to the, hey, I had her on my podcast back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> Hopefully 2019 will be the year of yeah. full recovery. Um, so uh, where do people find you? So you can find me right now on social media, Instagram and Facebook. I'm on Instagram significantly more. You're going to get a little bit more value there. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also will offer little freebies from time to time. Right now it's the neuroplasticity ebook. Um, but yeah, it's just a community resource. So it is community driven. So if someone has something they're frustrated with or they want to learn about, you know, reach out and tell me and we'll create content based on that. But it's okay. really, it's a good place to be. So I'll put all the links um, in the show notes, but uh, I'm, I've got your website, concussion.mollyparkerpt.com, right? And on Instagram, is yeah. it uh, at Instagram where, where it? It is Molly Parker PT on both Instagram and Facebook. Perfect. Um, all right. Hey, uh, I am so grateful for your time. Thank you so much. And uh, yeah, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit pause uh, or stop on the recording, but hang on one second. Thanks so much, Molly. Yeah. Uh,